I just want to note and highlight, we of course are celebrating African American History Month that starts today. And our public information office team is working on, it's, it's been the tradition, uh, in a, um, a presentation that we will give on February 15th, honoring and recognizing uh, the tremendous leaders in our African American community here in Montgomery County. So we look forward to that session, <coughs> everybody for uh, working on planning it. Uh, we now move on to our fifth item on the agenda, which is a public hearing. This is a public hearing on a supplemental appropriation to the FY22 operating budget, Montgomery County Government, uh, Department of Transportation, Transit Services, in the amount of $8,631,001. Uh, Government and Operations Committee work session will be scheduled at a later date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the Council's consideration should do so before the close of business on February 7th. Uh, each speaker this afternoon will have two minutes to speak and uh, you will be alerted when uh, you're approaching the end of your two minutes. Uh, we've had, you know, in, in a Zoom environment, sometimes have technical issues. So uh, apologies in advance if there are any glitches. Um, Ms. Lou, do we have any speakers for this particular public hearing? Good afternoon. Yes, we do. Our first speaker for this public hearing is Mr. Clint Sobrati. Mr. Sobrati, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Good afternoon, Council President, Vice President, and Council Members. My name is Clint Sobrati, and I'm a bus operator and now a transit coordinator with Right On. I am here today to urge you to pass the County Executive Supplemental Appropriation for the Montgomery County Department of Transportation to increase the salary for my fellow right on employees. The great resignation has hit everywhere. People are realizing that they don't want to go day in and day out to a job where they are, they are not happy and feel undervalued. If there are better jobs to be had elsewhere, they know. Thanks to the pandemic and the robust labor market, they can leave. That's happening in Montgomery County right, at right on. We're down at least 100 employees. We're seeing cuts in service just when we were nearing a pre-pandemic near for services. I love my job and I love Montgomery County. I have been with the county for 11 years at right on. What we're seeing right now is a crisis. Bus operators and others at right on have watched the salaries and benefits improve at the neighboring Washington Metro Area Transit Authority, better known as WMATA, while our salaries and benefits stagnate. Morals are awful. A mar market com compatibility shows that right on bus operators earn a first year salary of 45,776 compared to WMATA $53,663 for bus operators. Additionally, right on bus operators can reach their peak pay until 24 years into their career. By then, the salary is nearly 7,000 less than the counterparts at WMATA. Bus operators and transit coordinator never stop working when the pandemic hit. We are one of the few departments in Montgomery County that has stayed operational and continue to stay operational throughout the crisis. Over the past two years, we've shuttled our friends, neighbors. Sobrati, Sobrati, sorry to interrupt, sir, but your time is up. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is uh, Mr. Gino Rene. Mr. Rene, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Mr. President, fellow council members, on behalf of the 700 members working at Right On and represented by UFCW Local 1994, I urge you to pass a county executive special appropriation for the transit system. Montgomery County's Right On bus service is short over 100 drivers right now largely due to the salary inequity between ride on service and bus service operated by WMATA. This disparity is causing ride on employees to leave the county for the higher wages offered by WMATA. In fact, 75% of our drivers who left over the last three years have all gone to WMATA. Our ride on members have always relied on Montgomery County to provide competitive wages and the promise of a dignified retirement but they can't rely on that anymore. The county has disrupted their sense of employment stability by repeatedly not fully funding collectively bargained wage increases and benefit enhancements. The special appropriation will go a long way to reestablishing Montgomery County as an employer of choice for transit professionals. 
Employees would feel valued and respected. Morale will improve. Fewer drivers and other employees would leave would not leave service, and recruitment would improve. Public transit can be a great equalizer. We need more people to use mass transit if we want to mitigate the problems of traffic congestion and climate change. The first step to achieving these goals is to stabilize the ride-on workforce. To do so, we need the county council to fund this special appropriation. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Jane Lyons. Ms. Lyons, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you and good afternoon. My name is Jane Lyons and I'm speaking on behalf of the Coalition for Smarter Growth. I am here today in support of the supplemental budget appropriation to make sure that ride on bus operator salaries are competitive with Metro bus. Even before the Omicron wave, ride on was facing a bus operator shortage due to a variety of reasons. One of the best ways to address this challenge is to make the bus operator salary schedules competitive with our regional counterparts. Right now, our understanding is that Ride On loses good bus operators to Metro Bus due to Ride On's lower salary schedule. Montgomery County needs to adapt to evolving market conditions to help attract and maintain the employees who keep the county moving and connected. The transit system would be nothing without the people behind the scenes and out on the front lines doing the hard work. We need to value and invest in our critical human infrastructure, at least as much as we do our physical infrastructure. This morning, you issued a proclamation recognizing Transit Equity Day and the importance of a transit system that prioritizes equity. As the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice points out, improving the salary schedule would advance racial equity because transit operators and coordinators are disproportionately people of color. Moreover, it provides critical access to jobs and opportunity for riders who are overwhelmingly lower income and people of color. Thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Jerry Garson. Mr. Garson, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Okay, thank you. I am Jerry Garson, the president of the Seven Locks Civic Association, Inc., speaking on behalf of the supplemental appropriation for $8,631,000. We are also asking that the county council consider changes to the laws that would allow Montgomery County public school bus drivers to work as drivers for the Montgomery County ride on bus system when they are not working for the school system. This would include summers and days when they are not used by the school system. This would include Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. We see a region-wide nationwide shortage of bus drivers for schools and transit systems. The school bus drivers could also learn to operate Department of Transportation snow plows and soil spreaders when schools are closed due to snow. This would help reopen schools faster after snowstorms. The training could occur in the summer. Montgomery County should work with the state legislature. State legislation is probably needed to work with the school system, which is not an agency that Montgomery County has control over. The, the school transportation system is supervised by the State Board of Education, which probably has no one with any school bus transportation experience. You might also want to ask Montgomery Co uh, College, uh, Community College to have commercial driver's license classes to help add to the number of drivers the county needs for all methods of transportation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. And that wraps up our speakers for this public hearing, Mr. Council President. Thank you. This public hearing then is now closed. Our next public hearing is on Bill 122, Eating and Drinking Establishments, Healthy Meals for Children. This bill would require children's meals offered by food service facilities to include certain healthy food and beverage options and generally amend the law regarding eating and drinking establishments. A Health and Human Services Committee work session will be scheduled at a future date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on February 7th. If you would like to follow the progress of the council bill, the council website has a subscribe function. Go to the council website and use the view council records and legislative updates link to learn how. Ms. Liu, are there speakers for this public hearing? Yes, there are. Our first speaker is Mr. Stuart Burlow. Mr. Burlow, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, President Elbernaz, uh, Chairman, Chairman Rice. We really appreciate all of you at the council for supporting this really important legislation to help make healthier choices more available in our county. Um, 
Well, I think that all of you and everyone watching knows how much over the last few years we've seen how critical it is that everybody in our county and around the country have better access to healthier food, healthier, healthier beverages. And too often people don't, uh, particularly people of color in our county just don't have that the access to healthy food and in the busy lives that we're in. So this is a one really important but small step to, to improve the food environment of our county, allow parents and kids to make healthier choices. Um, and the standards in our bill are in the bill are based on years and years of data and science. And, and we would strongly encourage you to, for one, strengthen the bill and, and ensure that all kids' meals can be healthy, but really to resist any urges to weaken the standards in the, in the bill. Um, again, these are based on the best available science and data that we have um, to provide the healthiest choices for, for kids in the county. Um, so again, we would encourage you to, to maintain what's in there or, or strengthen it. Um, and at the end of the day, again, this is about healthier choices and options. Nothing in this law would prevent anybody, any parent or anyone else from purchasing any food, from ordering any food or any food at restaurants from being sold. It's simply an opportunity to make healthier options more available and make them easier. Um, and this would be doing what our neighbors in Prince George's have already done. Um, they were the first county in the entire country, the first place in the entire country uh, to pass legislation like this. So um, I know you all are competitive and, and if those Georgians can do the right thing to help their kids be healthier. Certainly you all uh, in Montgomery should be doing that as well. So thank you again, uh, particularly um, those of you who have signed on in support of the bill. Uh, Council Member Rice, we appreciate your leadership on this. And we look forward to working with all of you to, to help make the healthier choice the easier choice. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Robin Williams. Ms. Williams, you have two minutes for your testimony and you may begin when you are ready. Thank you very much. Um, again, my name is Robin Williams. I am a national board member of the NAACP, also serve at the Maryland NAACP, and speaking on behalf of our president of the Montgomery County branch of the NAACP, Linda Plummer and branch members. Thank you so much for submitting this bill. Under Bill 122, any food service facility that offers a children menu would be required to opt to offer one healthy kids meal as an option. The bill will not prevent a customer from requesting or a food service facility from selling a food or beverage that does not qualify under the healthy kids meal. In short, this bill does not prevent restaurants from serving other meals to children. This bill only requires restaurants to provide the kind of information and options that allow parents to make the best healthy choices for their children. Some people or entities may say that this is not necessary, but we know that almost 14 million children, 24% of the U.S. population ages 2 to 17, are obese. An additional 8.6 million children are at risk of obesity. Obese children often grow up to be obese adults. Um, while we should never shame anyone for their choices, we should acknowledge that obesity is a risk factor for four of the 10 leading causes of death, heart disease, type two diabetes, Ms. Williams, it seems that your connection is lost. Oh, we're, we're sorry, Ms. Williams. It looks like we, uh, we may have lost you there. Are you back? No. Okay, seems like her, the call dropped. Um, I'll move on to the next speaker, um, Ms. Bethany Mandel. Ms. Mandel, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready.
Is Ms. Mandel with us? Okay. I'll move on to the next speaker. Um, come back to Ms. Uh, Mandel later. Our next speaker is Mr. Uh, Ashanti Martinez. Mr. Martinez, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ashanti Martinez on behalf of CASA. CASA is here to write his testimony in support of Bill 122. At CASA, our mission is to create a more just society by building power and improving the quality of life in working class and immigrant communities. CASA is the region's largest community organization serving the immigrant community with a growing membership of over 115,000, over 20,000 of whom live in Montgomery County. We at CASA believe Bill 122 is the right tool to help working families provide healthier food options for their children. We know that families today eat out at restaurants more than ever before. The hustle and bustle of working life makes it difficult for parents to provide home cooked meals. This is especially difficult for our frontline essential workers, many of whom are immigrants. Unfortunately, these often convenient fast food meals aren't as healthy as the at home alternatives. They're instead packed with calories, salt, sugars, and fats. 42% of children ages two to nine eat fast food on any given day. That means almost half of our children are often not getting the necessary daily nutrients. Bill 122 aims to help working families and put a stop at putting kids at risk. The bill fixes that, the, the fixes that Bill 122 calls for will increase fruits, veggies, and whole grains on our children's plates and decrease calories, salt, sugar, and fat, which will assist in lowering the number of children with diabetes and heart disease. Everyone who lives, works, and plays in Montgomery County deserves the opportunity to choose healthier food and drink options. We look forward to continuing to work in partnership with the county to provide healthier options for our children and urge a favorable review of Bill 122. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Andres Garcia. Mr. Garcia, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Thank you. When will it be enough? Through the 2020 lockdowns, hiring shortages, enforcing mask mandates, reduced indoor capacity, and the weight of potentially enforcing proof of vax vaccine mandates, restaurants are struggling to, to survive in Montgomery County and indeed across the country. Instead of offering solutions to ease operational pressures for restaurants, the, the backbone of thriving and vibrant communities, uh, or guidance to help restore lost business, the council instead tries to mandate what's on their menus down to the milligram. When will it be enough? Bill 122, while apparently well-intentioned, would only further increase the strain on restaurants to stay afloat. Failure to meet this bill's requirements constitutes a Class A violation, including daily fines up to $750. When will it be enough? Montgomery County residents understand the benefits of a healthy diet and regular exercise, including for their children. There is no utility, let alone constitutional precedent, in mandating menu options if parents and children can freely choose unhealthy meals. And I certainly hope the council won't consider legislation mandating what restaurant patrons are allowed to order. There are far more government health regulations than existed 30 years ago, yet childhood obesity is more prevalent than ever. That is a sign that restaurants need less government oversight, not more. They have had enough. A vote in favor of Bill 122 will be another nail in the coffin for family owned and operated restaurants in Montgomery County. Do not support a quote unquote solution that will cause far more harm than the problem. You will never legislate someone to be healthy, not if they prefer the freedom to be unhealthy, no matter how hard you try. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Dr. Yolandra Hancock. Dr. Hancock, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you guys so much. I am pulling it up now, I'm ready. I'm Dr. Yolandra Hancock, a pediatrician, a public health advocate, and most importantly, a mother. I want to thank Council Member Rice for his dedication to the children of Montgomery County by sponsoring this critical piece of legislation. As we've navigated through this pandemic, our children have paid the ultimate price. Over 10 million have acquired COVID-19, nearly 36,000 have been hospitalized, and 870 children have lost their lives. For those either hospitalized or dying from COVID, a study in the journal Pediatrics demonstrated that the leading chronic diseases associated with the severity of COVID-19 infections included obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. 
with children of color disproportionately impacted by both COVID and chronic diseases, where they make up over 50% of COVID-19 hospitalizations and over 60% of COVID-19 related deaths. Clearly something must be done. When the risk of getting severely ill from and or dying from COVID is intricately tied to diet related diseases, now is the time to take swift action. Passing Bill 1-22 does just that. By establishing specific guidelines for children's meals and beverages, this policy facilitates the healthy choice being the easy choice and provides healthier options for busy parents like myself to choose from. According to the CDC, over 33% of our children eat fast food on a given day. As a pediatrician, I would love this number to be lower, but as a working mother, I fully understand the demands on families' time and the necessary convenience of eating out. It's our collective responsibility as parents, policymakers, and community members, inclusive of small and large food establishments, to create the healthiest environment possible so that each of our children can reach their full health potential as we come out of this pandemic. It will be argued that this legislation puts additional burden on food establishments recovering from the pandemic. I would counter that by asking, what price is too much to protect our children's health as they recover? Please vote in favor of Bill 1-22. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mr. Willie Flowers. Mr. Flowers, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you are ready. Mr. President, um, Chairman Rice and other members of the of the council. My name is Willie Flowers, president of the NAACP Maryland State Conference, and I'm here to testify in favor of Bill 122, or the Healthy Eating and Drinking Establishments Healthy Meals Children Bill. The NAACP stands with the Coalition of Grassroots Organizations in Montgomery County on this legislation. Passing this bill is an important step to help mitigate the negative effects of disease and sickness in the African American and other marginalized community communities because of unhealthy food options. The bill gives direction to restaurants and fast food spots to become a part of the movement to assure nu nutrient rich food options and not traditional options that advance obesity and other negative health outcomes. In Marcia Chatelain's book called Franchise, The Golden Arches in Black America, she goes into much detail about the trail of pain that black and brown communities endure because of the neglect of not just planning designs, but also the negative health outcomes that follow food, follow food options that are not nutrient rich and advance optimal health. We have known for years about the steps that corporate advertising has had on the health outcomes of families and communities. Well, Bill 122 gives restaurants a simple way of showcasing their healthy options to families moving forward. This will bring value to the customer and will maintain faith in any eatery as a positive community steward. The NAACP uh, Maryland State Conference stands in support of local, the local Montgomery County branch and their coalition in passage of this bill. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Sarah Rebecca. Ms. Rebecca, if you have two minutes for your testimony, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Hi. I'm Sarah Rubikov, a Senior Policy Associate at the Center for Science and the Public Interest. CSPI supports Bill 122. This bill ensures healthy options as part of restaurant kids' meals, but does not limit a parent or caregiver's ability to choose for their family. When children eat out, they typically consume more calories, added sugars, and sugary drinks, and fewer fruits, vegetables, and whole grains than when they eat at home. Sugary drinks are often automatically included with children's meals, adding unnecessary calories with little or no nutritional benefits. Further, designating particular foods and beverages as children's menu items or bundling them together as children's meals are a powerful form of marketing. This marketing helps to establish norms for children, affecting their preferences and lifelong eating patterns. According to the most recent report of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee, consistent scientific evidence demonstrates that diets higher in vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and lean meats, and lower in sugar-sweetened drinks are associated with beneficial outcomes for obesity and associated chronic diseases, including heart disease, type 2 diabetes, and some cancers. Other states and localities have turned to public policy to improve restaurant children's meals in their communities. For example, in 2020, Prince George's County became the first and only locality in the country to pass similar legislation that ensures at least one kid's meal combination meets expert nutrition standards. 
Healthier children's meals can reduce sugary drink consumption, encourage children to form healthy eating habits, and support parents' efforts to feed their children well. CSPI urges the Montgomery County Council to join this growing movement by voting in support of Bill 122. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, it doesn't look like Ms. Mendel has joined us, so that wraps up our speakers for this public hearing. Thank you, Ms. Liu. This public hearing is now closed. Uh, we now move on to the next item on the agenda, uh, which is uh, item number seven. And this is also a public hearing on expedited bill 222, Montgomery County Municipal Revenue Program with amendments. This bill would alter the calculation of reimbursement to municipalities for eligible costs, alter the requirements for municipalities to participate in the municipal revenue program, provide for a timeline of when certain reimbursement activities must be accomplished, and uh, amend reimbursements uh, for the City of Tacoma Park Police Services, provide for a phased in implementation period, and generally amend uh, the law related to the Montgomery County Municipal Revenue Program. A government operations Committee work session will be scheduled at a future at a future date. Persons wishing to submit additional material for the council's consideration should do so before the close of business on February 7th. Uh, Ms. Liu, do we have any public uh, speakers for this public hearing? Yes, we do. Our first speaker is Mayor Bridget Donald Newton. Ms. Newton, you have two minutes for your testimony. We begin when you are ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council President Albanez and members of the County Council. I'm Bridget Donald Newton, Mayor of the City of Rockville, and I thank you all for the opportunity to provide the City's comments on Expedited Bill 2-22. This legislation is a tremendous step forward for Rockville and all of Montgomery County's municipalities. We are extremely pleased with the collaborative negotiation process undertaken by the Office of the County Executive, led by Chief Administrative Officer Rich Madalino, Ken Hartman, Director of Strategic Partners, Rockville Council Member Monique Ashton, President of the Maryland Municipal League, of the Montgomery County chapter and her board. This bill brings equity to those who pay municipal taxes on top of the county. Expedited Bill 2-22 and the FY22 special appropriation to the operating budget in the amount of $5 million for payments to municipalities are the results of this very successful process and we strongly support both measures. Expedited Bill 2-22 codifies the municipal tax duplication formulas, alters the county code to allow for reimbursement for policing services, and sets forth an annual timeline for certifications, negotiations, and payments, all of which are key priorities for Rockville and the MML Montgomery chapter. Through a phased-in approach, Expedited Bill 2-22 achieves full funding in FY25. This solution is long overdue and will help us address shortfalls created by previously underfunded years. Please vote to approve expedited bill 222 as soon as possible so that the revised formulas take effect in FY23 as proposed by the county executive. In closing, we thank Council President Albernez for sponsoring bill 2-22, Council Member Hucker as a former sponsor in his role as Council President, Council Member Navarro and the GO Committee for crafting a path forward, and Council Member Katz and the County Council for your ongoing support. Through an unprecedented level of partnership between the county and municipalities, we have finally achieved a resolution to this long-standing issue. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is uh, Mayor Jeffrey Slavin. M Mayor Slavin, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Good afternoon, Ding distinguished council members, and thank you for this opportunity. I am Jeffrey Slavin, Mayor of the Town of Somerset and one of the founding members of Montgomery Mayors. In Annapolis, there has long been a misconception that Montgomery County is the land of great wealth and resources, resulting in governors and majorities in the General Assembly not always allocating resources back to us in an equitable manner. Using the same logic, I am here to say that county executives and county councils have historically taken advantage of vague or outdated policies which has resulted in municipal residents being overcharged for vital services. This has been a nagging problem during my 20 years, two decades of elected service despite numerous attempts to resolve it. Accordingly, I'm here today to implore the council to unanimously adopt Bill 222. It is my belief that approval of this legislation will result in a more equitable division of tax revenues and assist county municipalities of all sizes in balancing our budgets so that we can provide even better services to our citizens. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mayor Judd Ashman. Mayor Ashman, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon to all my county council friends and colleagues. I, uh, I'm Judd Ashman, Mayor of Gaithersburg, and um, I'm going to echo uh, Mayors Newton and Slavin in strong support of this bill and just offer uh, a bit of background for the public. Virtually all the municipalities in Montgomery County provide services that if the municipal government wasn't there, the county would otherwise have to provide. This is why we're here. In, in, in Gaithersburg, um, examples of these are, are mostly about road maintenance and primary agency police services. But in other municipalities, there may be other services as well. And essentially, municipal residents pay for those services twice, once in their local municipal taxes and then again in their county taxes. And we refer to this situation as tax duplication. And I think probably zero to one percent of the general public understands what this is. Um, so I, I, I hope that explanation is is uh, is helpful. But in a right and just world, the county would reimburse the municipalities for its share of these services that it would otherwise have to provide. And to some degree, it has done this. However, you know, 10 years ago, post financial crisis, the reimbursement level was frozen even as costs for providing these services have continued to go up. And, and so it's the residents of our county's municipalities that get left holding the bag. So this bill goes a long way to making things right. Um, and it's, it's sort of, it's the result of literally decades of back and forth negotiations between the county and municipalities. And I wanna commend, join Mayor Newton in commending the county executive's office and all of our municipal colleagues for getting us to this place Particular shout out to Rockville Council Member Monique Ashton for her strong leadership. We ask that you uh, strongly support this bill, give it the support it deserves, and bring to a close this long-standing issue. And as always, uh, we thank you, uh, all of our county council colleagues, for all that you do for our community. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mayor Kate Stewart. Mayor Stewart, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here today and for all you're doing for our community. Um, I think my colleagues um, across Montgomery County stated it best. And I want to thank um, Mayor of the Gaithersburg for explaining tax duplication because it is an issue that sometimes people do not understand. Um, but this has been a longstanding issue. And I'm so glad to say that in 2022, we are going to begin to resolve it. Um, I want to thank you all for your dedication to this, seeing it through, and particularly, as my colleagues have said, to thank um, Monique Ashton, who has really led um, the collaborative work that we've done uh, with the county exec's office. Uh, what you have before you uh, represents hours of work, uh, back and forth, a lot of communication, and we're very proud of the product that is before you today. So we hope you will favorably uh, view it as we do, and that we can say 2022 was the year that we actually started resolving tax duplication. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Mayor Tracy Furman. Ms. Mayor Furman, you have two minutes for your testimony. May begin when you're ready. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, President Albernas and Council for having us and holding this hearing. Um, I'm Tracy Furman, and I've had the privilege of serving as mayor of the town of Kensington since 2016. I'm here today to support Bill Number 2-22, the expedited bill. Um, for too long, municipalities have been un unable to rely on predictable property tax reimbursements for duplicate services. Um, back in 2014, when I was just a lonely little council member, I remember a meeting at Garrett Park where uh, council member Katz was present and we browbeated him as a former mayor of why couldn't we get tax duplication to, its, um, to this point. So um, I want to thank everyone on the council and the executive's office for getting us now to that time period. Um, the town of Kensington maintains 8.5 miles of public paved streets, as well as eight public parks. They are for the enjoyment, not just for our residents, but for the greater Kensington community and beyond. The reimbursements from the county will allow us to be more efficient in our maintenance and making needed improvements in our parks and, our, and on our public streets. I wanna thank again, the county executive's office and Rich Madalena particularly, and, uh, and his staff for sitting down with our chapter leadership to resolve this long overdue dilemma. The agreed codifications of the tax du duplication formulated in expedited Bill 222 uh, uh, presents deserves a loud hallelujah. 
Uh, we ask that the council support Bill 222 so our municipal residents who are also have the privilege of living in the greatest county in Maryland can receive services equitably and to the benefit of many in our community. community. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Ms. Gary Cook. Ms. Cook, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Hi, thank you. I'm uh, here representing another mu municipality in favor of this bill, and I don't want to take up uh, too much of your time. In fact, if I were if I were able to be there in person, I would love to just walk up to the mic and say ditto. Um, but um, I will just say a few words. Um, I'm Carrie Cook. I'm representing a mun municipality as a commissioner uh, for the town of Poolsville and also as a board member for the Maryland Municipal League Montgomery chapter. Um, I do think it's important um, for representatives uh, like myself to lend our voice because um, you are hearing from the big cities. Um, from the folks down county, and this bill really is important to all of us, to all the municipalities in the county. Um, it really rights a wrong um, that's been going on for a very long time. Um, I'd really uh, like to specifically thank um, Council Member Navarro um, for introducing this in the GEO committee. Um, for to Council Member Katz for all of your work on this. Council Member Friedson. Um, Council President and Vice President Albernaz and Glass, um, really everyone on the council, um, as well as the county executive and um, his staff, Ken Hartman and Rich Madaleno, um, have just been so collaborative. Um, it's been uh, really a, a collective effort. Um, I also want to give a little shout out to um, uh, Council uh, Member uh, the City of Rockville, uh, Mon Monique Ashton, who is our president of our uh, Montgomery chapter. Um, she's really kind of kept all of us towns and cities with our eyes on the ball through all of this. Um, and really just a good outcome for this bill um, helps all of, all of our municipalities. But honestly, at the end of the day, it's, it helps our Montgomery County residents. So thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker is Council Member Monique Ashton. Council Member Ashton, you have two minutes for your testimony. You may begin when you're ready. Thank you, everyone. Uh, happy Black History Month and Happy Lunar New Year. Uh, <laughs> Council, Council, staff and residents, and, and good afternoon, President Albanals and Vice President Glass, and uh, thank you again to all the County Council members. My name is Monique Ashton. I am the Council Member of the City of Rockville, and today I'll be speaking in my capacity as President of the Montgomery County Chapter of the Maryland Municipal League, which represents more than 20 municipalities in our county. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here for today, and just a huge thank you to all of you and staff for bringing forward uh, expedited bill 222. Uh, really appreciate the work of the GO committee and Councilman Navarro. Uh, thank you to uh, Councilmember Freeman and Katz on that committee as well. I also wanna thank uh, Councilmember Hucker and his role uh, as uh, president in supporting uh, the special appropriation that we testified on last um, month, as well as the entire county council and the county executive's office. This is really a historic moment in helping to facilitate negotiation on meetings for tax duplication. And I also just wanna echo the testimonies of the mayors you've heard from today. Um, this is our moment to make a difference and to solve a two decades long challenge. Um, you heard about tax duplication and essentially uh, there are portions of the property tax revenue collected by the county that funds services that are provided by our municipality and that portion is the tax duplicated portion. Um, these funds are, are very well needed by our municipalities and I believe earned by our municipalities to help to support the services that we have for our residents. And again, as you heard before, people, uh, we are supporting roads, vision zero, uh, police services in some of our municipalities. And we really need the equity um, to, to bring back to our residents. Um, I did want to note that there are four key highlights of the bill. Um, it does provide the much needed codification. There's a lot of question mark on what's covered, what's not covered. This will help solve the challenge of that, as well as clearly articulate a process and the formulas that are provided. It will also uh, establish that 100% phase implementation plan uh, by 2025. Your time is up. 
and uh, ending, I do want to thank you for uh, bringing this forward and look forward to working with you in, in the future. Please do approve this uh, special appropriation as well as expedited bill 222. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And that wraps up our speakers for this public hearing, Mr. Council President. Thank you. Just a point of privilege before we formally wrap up this public hearing. I just want to, I know I speak on behalf of all of my colleagues and really thanking our municipal partners and leaders for the incredible alliance uh, and partnership. That partnership has never been more important than uh, the relationship we've had these last two years on behalf of all of our residents. Uh, I know this has been a long time coming. We look forward to the committee sessions and I echo the thanks given to all of my colleagues who have been working on this, uh, both in this council and previous councils. So thank you all so much. We look forward to the public, to the, the, the work sessions on this. Uh, so with that, this public hearing is now closed. All right, uh, we are now going to move on to item eight on our agenda, uh, which are the interviews for the Board of Appeals. We are joined this afternoon uh, by William England, Seth Grimes, and Roberto Pinero. Thank you uh, to all three of you for joining us today. Uh, I have five questions that I will ask of all three of you, and we are going to do these in uh, first alphabetical order and then reverse alphabetical order uh, to get us through all these questions and give everybody the same opportunity to respond. So thank you all again for your interest and your commitment and your civic advocacy. Uh, we so appreciate uh, you coming before us today. So the first question is, if you could briefly discuss why you are interested in becoming a member of the Board of Appeals. Uh, we will start with Mr. William England. Thank you, President Albanoz. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, President Albanoz and uh, Council. Uh, first, I see this as an opportunity to continue my life's work of public service, beginning with my 20-year career as an Army officer through service as an administrative law judge with the uh, Maryland Office of Administrative Hearings and the District of Columbia Office of Administrative Hearings. Most of my work has been in public service. Second, I have resided in Montgomery County for 25 years and have enthusiastically embraced opportunities to engage in civic and public service activities as a member of the uh, Montgomery County Human Rights Commission, uh, the Community Action Board, uh, and the North Bonifant Woods Homeowners Association. Therefore, I view <coughs> service on the Board of Appeals as still another opportunity to continue to serve the citizens of Montgomery County. Third, I am approaching retirement from full-time work as an administrative law judge and believe that service on the Board of Appeals is an ideal next step in my public service. Finally, I suggest that I am well qualified to make immediate positive contributions to the Board of Appeals. I am an experienced and skilled administrative adjudicator. I am an excellent writer and I know how to preside over contested case administrative hearings. It would be an honor to have the opportunity to continue to serve the citizens of Montgomery County as a member of the Board of Appeals. Thank you so much, Mr. England. Mr. Grimes. Oh, thank you, Council President and Council Members. I really appreciate your choosing to interview me today. Uh, this is a, an exciting opportunity for me. I did appear before you two years ago applying for this position, but you appointed another person whose resignation has created a vacancy, so I thought, why not give it another shot? I uh, remain extremely interested in serving in this position. You know my level of community engagement, which is focused on Montgomery County and the state of Maryland. Much of my advocacy has been focused on climate action, on policing and justice reform, on transit, and I've also worked extensively on zoning and land use matters, not only policy, but also projects. We recognize that Board of Appeals is not a policy position. Uh, for instance, most recently, I led a local nonprofit's exploration this last fall of uses allowed by zoning and regulations for a property that was that the nonprofit was slated to acquire. So I've been on the other side of the table here, as well as uh, having served in public bodies uh, similar to what you're doing. Uh, this is interesting work for me, not the first project that I've been involved in. I applied for Board of Appeals appointment because I know how critical it is 
both for applicants and for the county to have knowledgeable, fair, impartial, and engaged board members who will work well with staff, with fellow board members, with county agencies, and with the public, who will do the research required and who will make well-founded, defensible positions rooted in zoning code and land use rules. Uh, that's me. I'm called to service. I'm dedicated to it. And further, I understand the needs of just about every part of the county, from Burtonsville to Dickerson to Bethesda to Hillendale. I have the experience and aptitude for this job, and I'd be honored to be appointed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Uh, Mr. Pinedo, same question. Briefly discuss why you were interested in becoming a member of the Board of Appeals. Yes. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, Council President Albornoz and Council Vice President Glass and other council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity inviting me for this interview. I'm honored to, uh, to appear in front of you. The reason I'm interested is uh, two reasons, basically. One is that I think it's a good fit for my qualifications. And the second reason is because I want to continue uh, to be of service to the county. So in terms of my qualifications, uh, as you all probably know, because I've applied to this position before and also to the to becoming a member of the planning board, I am a planner. Uh, I was, uh, I'm a Harvard tra trained city planner. Uh, so I bring to the board my technical knowledge about zoning, land use, master plans, site plans, architectural drawings, lot coverage, building heights, and so forth. I mean, these are all factors that will help the board in its deliberations uh, with regards to variances, appeals, modifications, and conditional use decisions. Uh, in terms of service to the county, I just, you know, I want to refresh your memory. I, I served uh, on HOC board for 12 years, and I was a chair of the Interagency Commission on Homelessness. So I think both because of my qualifications as a planner and also uh, my desire to continue to uh, do service to the county where I had lived and raised my children for the last 30 years, I think I would be a good fit. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Pineda. We're gonna start with you for this second question. So uh, stay with us. Uh, tell us about a time where you have helped to achieve consensus among groups or individuals with differing points of view. Sure. Um, thank you for that question. I, you know, I have served on a number of boards, um, you know, for basic, basically uh, low-income housing boards and uh, with the Interagency Commission on Homelessness. I think the example I'm going to bring is when I was, the, uh, when I was with HOC. Uh, I was selected by my peers to be the chair of HOC about 10 years ago, and one of the <laughs> experiences situations that I faced was at the ED at the time, which uh, some of you have been on the council for many years. Uh, his name was Cot Minton. He decided to retire because his wife was sick. So officer, as you know, one of the main responsibilities of a board is selecting the leadership, selecting the executive director. So all of a sudden, when I was the chair of HOC, I had to undertake that um, responsibility uh, of hiring a new EB. So we did a search, we did interviews, but you know, it's a seven member board. So it's difficult to arrive at any kind of consensus. Um, people had different criteria as to what they wanted in an ED. Some wanted management experience. I particularly wanted someone creative, someone who was willing to take a risk, someone who uh, was thinking of how they could do deals and get back up because the executive staff was so good. I wasn't that much concerned about, you know, how the executive staff was going to support the, the executive director. So, but the executive staff was also concerned about um, their jobs. <laughs> so they started lobbying the board uh, in terms of they wanted someone internal. They didn't want someone from outside. So that was a very tough, uh, tough situation. And as a chair, and I was in, in charge of the uh, search committee, one of the ways I was able to achieve consensus is by developing a very clear set of criteria. And afterwards, after we had interviewed all the candidates, checking all the references of the finalists. 
but still it was a very tough decision because of all the different, you know, different points of view. Uh, but finally we did select someone who you guys all know uh, because you've dealt with him the last nine years. He left uh, HOC, but you know, he was someone with a lot of creativity, a lot of talent, even though at the time he didn't have that much management experience, but he did acquire that. So that's a situation where we achieve consensus by principally, you know, my, my style as the chair was uh, a very participatory way, uh, a lot of teamwork. I involved all the board members in the decision uh, and preparing the kind of a list of the pros and cons of each candidate. And, uh, and I think uh, we did, we made a, a right decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Grimes, same question. Thanks. You know, I've served on many boards and civic committees around Montgomery County, uh, nonprofits, uh, involved in public safety on the Shepherd's Table Board for six years and so on. And I see no issues more contentious than land use issues. They pit neighbor against neighbor. Uh, we see that now in the discussions of Thrive that are before you. Uh, people are concerned about traffic and parking. They're concerned about what they see as undesirable or designs or uses in their neighborhoods about preserving what they see as the character their neighbors, their neighborhood should have. Uh, we have to work with these concerns, whether we think they're justified or not. Uh, within the bounds of zoning law, land use regulations, and permitting processes. So I'll offer as an example a project I was intimately involved with, the creation of a community commercial kitchen at the Tacoma Park Presbyterian Church. So the story is that back in late 2011, the church was looking for ways to use their facility located in a residential neighborhood, actually just around the corner from where I live, for community benefit. The thought was to renovate the existing church kitchen as a food production incubator space for small businesses, uh, many of them immigrant run. I was newly elected as the Tacoma Park City Council representative for the ward as well as being a neighbor, and I agreed to help advance this project. I participated as a core team member for over two years working with the church and with the Crossroads Community Food Network. Uh, that includes now State Delegate Lorik Charkudian. Former Councilmember George Leventhal introduced a zoning text amendment to allow this use, noting that the church is located in a residential neighborhood, and here the complications began. Uh, some of the neighbors were upset. They feared that the project would, well, effectively destroy the character of the neighborhood. You all have heard this before. You've heard it recently. Well, I worked with the church crossroads team to develop a business plan and operating parameters that address neighborhood concerns. Things like when would the trash be picked up and how often where would the trash be stored? When would the deliveries occur? What were the operating hours going to be? I, I also worked with another church tenant, a uh, child development center to uh, smooth the drop off and pick up traffic flow and the parking arrangements, arrange outside parking. Uh, I was the point person on the Tacoma Park City Council to try to build uh, support within the city for this project because if the council had opposed it, it would have died. And I helped him raise money. I uh, brought Sheila Hickson and my then uh, delegate to uh, raise state money and we got $75,000 from the county and convinced the neighbors. On one specific zoning point, a former Montgomery County Council member uh, tried to impose a conditional use in the zoning text amendment. Uh, you'll not be surprised that the conditional use was favored by Mark Elrich. Uh, fortunately, we built support in the council to move away with an unlimited use. Uh, there's much more to the story, of course. You don't need to know those details, but what counts is that the kitchen was completed. It is operating. It is providing small business opportunities to local food businesses without disruption feared or lingering conflict. And I did play a central role in making this happen and smoothing the con community concerns, addressing them without compromising on the mission of the kitchen. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Um, Mr. England, uh, the same question for you. Tell us about a time where you have helped to achieve consensus among groups or individuals with differing points of view. Yeah. I served as a commission officer in the Army in a variety of leadership positions. Effective leadership frequently requires facilitating consensus among a group of individuals on how to best achieve mission accomplishment. Uh, one example of achieving a consensus is when I served as the Equal Admissions Opportunity Officer 
at the United States Military Academy at West Point. I was the first non-West Point grad admissions officer to serve as an admissions officer at West Point, and I was considered an outsider among the admissions staff. My job was to recruit motivated racial and ethnic minorities to seek admission to West Point, and I frequently had to persuade the admissions committee made up of the academic uh, chairs uh, and other staff, all West Point grads, uh, to offer appointments to uh, some minority and ethnic uh, candidates who uh, did not meet the regular admissions criteria. Uh, I was quite successful in this job and obtained appointments for, for example, 89 Black candidates in the West Point class of 1979, uh, the largest number up to that date. Another example is when I served as an administrative law judge in Maryland, where I both adjudicated and mediated special education disputes uh, between parents of children with disabilities and the school systems, including Montgomery County Public Schools. Uh, these mediations focused on uh, getting the parties to agree on identifying a student's specific disabilities, their educational needs, and the services that the school systems must provide to ensure that the students receive a free appropriate public education. As you can imagine, these disputes often involve passionate advocacy from parents for their children and equally strong opinions from professional educators about how to best educate these children. I was more successful than not in mediating many of these special education disputes. Thank you, Mr. England. Uh, we'll start with you for this third question. Please explain your understanding of the role of the Board of Appeals and how it serves our community. Thank you. Uh, understanding the role of the Board of Appeals must start with the mission statement, uh, quote, to assist the public in understanding and to hear and decide in a quasi-judicial setting inquiries and applications that arise primarily under Chapter 59 of the Montgomery County Code, the zoning ordinance, for variances, administrative appeals of certain decisions of county agencies, and for oral argument on conditional use decisions or modifications of special exceptions. The public policy supporting the mission of the Board of Appeals is described in the purpose of the zoning ordinance, which is to provide zoning requirements for the county designed to <clears throat> control street suggestion, uh, congestion, promote health, public safety and general welfare, provide adequate light and air, promote the conservation of natural resources, prevent environmental pollution, and avoid undue concentration of population, and promote or facilitate adequate transportation, water, sewage, schools, recreations, parks, and other public facilities. The board carries out its mission by processing applications for and <clears throat> oppositions to applications for variances, the modification of existing special exceptions, appeals of conditional use decisions, and administrative appeals of decisions from several county agencies. The Board of Appeals conducts its hearings uh, in accordance with the with its rules of procedure, uh, section uh, 288 of the Montgomery County Code. And in adjudicating uh, the cases before the board, uh, they may apply the zoning ordinance uh, that existed prior to October 30th of 2014, or the zoning ordinance that is effective as of October 30th, 2014. The board conducts public uh, meetings every Wednesday and working sessions every other Wednesday. All meetings are generally open to the public. And thanks, Mr. England. Uh, Mr. Grimes, uh, please explain your understanding of the role of the Board of Appeals and how it serves our community. Yeah, thanks. So we, we have formal definitions. Yes, the Board of Appeals hears and decides cases involving land use issues, including variances in development standards from development standards and other zoning uh, matters as well as administrative appeals. Uh, we know that uh, we also know, as I stated earlier, the board is not a policy making body. However, members must be well versed in the zoning code and in land use policy 
in community standards. They have to be mind readers uh, in terms of what other community leaders want. Well, not just mind readers, but to actually talk to them. Uh, they have to be able to act impartially and render informed fair judgments based on the zoning ordinance. Uh, this is all clear. What is less clear is the necessity to have good relationships where one can call on uh, the county uh, permitting services, on planning board and staff, on political leaders in the county, on neighborhood leaders in the county to understand uh, the conditions on the ground, let's call them, uh, because what's in the zoning code, and I've read it extensively, I've been involved in advocacy around master plans and minor master plans, amendments and all that kind of stuff. All these things are open to interpretation, uh, especially if you involve high priced lawyers from uh, downtown Bethesda. Uh, so uh, we need to have uh, a basis in the code in practices, understanding of how permitting operates, relationships to call on when forming opinions, uh, respect for staff, respect for colleagues. Uh, we have to present a good public view. And we also have to understand that not all applicants are equal uh, in the sense that many will be intimidated by the need to go before the board in order to uh, appeal their cases, especially ones from less advantaged backgrounds. So these are all ingredients of successful operations of the Board of Appeals, indicative, indicative of the role that it does play in the community to, to uh, facilitate building and development at small scale and large. Thank you. Mr. Pinedo? Yes, um, I agree with both uh, Mr. Grimes and Mr. England in terms of how they describe the role of the Board of Appeals. I think it's definitely, it's, uh, it's a quasi-judicial body that decides on issues that do not conform generally to land use and zoning ordinance. Um, and the way I, I mean, I think the board um, has to have a, a, a representation outside with the community, definitely. I, I agree with, with uh, what Mr. England is saying. But again, this has to be discussed internally within the board to see what the role of each board member is in terms of uh, dealing with the with outside of the Board of Appeals. I think the other thing that I think it's important is that the board has staff. It has a hearing examiner. I think the role of the, uh, of the board should not just be uh, a rubber stamp, let's say, on the recommendation ba uh, made by the staff, but ask the right questions and give the opportunity uh, to provide oversight over the role of the staff. Um, I think that responsibility is very serious in terms of listening to people who come before the board. And uh, because we have, you know, the board members, we all have a legal and fiduciary duty. Uh, it is important that the board be inclusive and allow for participation of all members in the community. And uh, it's important also for the board members to become involved in terms of uh, uh, any strategic plan, any discussion about how it's working right now, how it needs to be restructured, if it needs to be restructured, and how it reviews the performance of the staff. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pineda. We just have two more questions. The last one's pretty straightforward. Um, the fourth question is, how would you position the board to work on racial equity and social justice issues? Mr. Pineda, once again, we're going to start with you. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Councilmember Navarro for taking leadership on issues that have to do with racial equity and social justice. Uh, I feel that as a Latino in the county, I am very concerned about the disparities uh, that people of color have in this county. And it is important for the board to take into account issues related to racial equity and social justice. I think it is crucial that the board treat everyone equally and with respect, uh, it's important to listen to them and to show empathy, both to the uh, person who is appealing to the board and the neighbors who may be responding to that appeal. And that all meetings be open to the public and that the staff, again, like I said before, be held accountable to any unwritten rules regarding people of color, trying to get, uh, let's say a, people, a person of color tries to get a variance uh, because they're adding or renovating a property, it is important that they be treated equally. Um, the staff, like Mr. Uh, Grimes said, we need, the staff needs to reach out to the underserved community. 
explaining the process of working with DPS, with the Department of Permitting Services, before people apply for a variance. They need to be more proactive in educating the underserved community about what changes they can and cannot do to their housing under the current zoning. The mean, this means not only collaborating with uh, the planning agency, but also with the Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice. Uh, if there's any concern regarding either the staff or the, the person who's appealing, uh, who's applying for a variance. The, the board also needs to work with the county, like any other agency, and look at the impacts of its decisions on racial equity and social justice. And this is very important. It needs to measure the impact of those decisions. And I think that has to be done throughout every, every agency in the county sh that makes a decision should be finding a way of measuring that impact. I uh, believe that uh, one of the uh, goals is that the, that, well, my particular interest is that the forms, the information, and anything that is available in the website be also available in other languages other than English and to the extent that it's possible if, if someone comes in front of the ball uh, in front of the board to appeal that they be provided some kind of and they need translation services that they need be need be provided those services uh, if it's needed. Thank you very much. Thank you Mr. Pinedo. Mr. Grimes. I'm not so sure this is uh, quite so simple and straightforward a question. Zoning and land use rules have a racist history, including here in Montgomery County. So do mortgage lending decisions by private mortgage lenders. And for that matter, so does government spending on roads and other infrastructure, on schools, on community amenities. Uh, we are engaged collectively as a county, yourselves on the county council, in redressing this situation and making things right. It's extremely important work. The history, however, has repercussions to this day. The Board of Appeals has to ensure that its decisions are held to the racial equity standards that the council mandates and applies itself. Uh, this is of extreme importance. Our approach on the board must be further within the board's operations to counter implicit bias that every individual brings to the table. And we also need to recognize that some applicants may feel intimidated by board processes or simply unfamiliar with them. And they require consideration uh, given their backgrounds. Myself, I've had uh, two courses of diver diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Uh, one was connected to my professional work as an advisor on artificial intelligence technologies for TEDCO, the Maryland Technology Development Corporation. And this last fall, I had further training when I took on a temporary three-day-a-week role doing electoral canvassing in Northern Virginia with an organization called New Virginia Majority. I personally knocked on over 4,000 doors in heavily immigrant and Latino neighborhoods. And I'll digress that I enjoy this work very much. And one of the highlights was when uh, a number of us were pulled off the streets for a rally with Lieutenant Governor, unfortunately losing Lieutenant Governor candidate Hala Ayala, a rally that featured Dolores Huerta. I was thrilled to be able to uh, hear her in person. I enjoy this work. Uh, just over a year ago, I worked for the Democratic Senate Campaign Committee in Georgia doing electoral canvassing for now Senators Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. Inclusion is important. It's important to go out and include people. Well, that's not the Board of Appeals process where people come to us. Still, we have to be open and inclusive and understanding of the needs of the individuals who come before us. And we have to be trained to uh, overcome our own biases and to render fair decisions that are rooted in law. I will do my best to act and hold the board to the highest standards where racial equity and social justice are concerned. Uh, that's my pledge to you. Thank you, Mr. Grimes. Mr. England. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to applaud the responses of both Mr. Panera and Mr. Grimes to this question. Additionally, I think it is important for the Board of Appeals to understand and appreciate the continuing presence and impact of racial and ethnic discrimination in American society. Inequities across this country manifest in how access or lack of access to resources 
impact people's ability to accumulate financial, social, and human capital. These inequities and lack of opportunity have become embedded in our society in many forms, including structural racism. Deficits of opportunity intersect, and we cannot ignore the circumstances and environments in which racial and ethnic minorities live and the opportunities that are denied them due to these <clears throat> circumstances and environments. A current example of the existing inequities in our society is the disparate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has had on racial and ethnic minorities. These inequities manifest in the form of greater exposure to the coronavirus due to fewer jobs that permit remote work, for example, nursing homes, a real retail and factory jobs, limited access to health care, and inequality of the health care system, greater job loss, and resulting displacement from housing. Uh, before the pandemic, for example, studies show that almost 30% of Black college-educated households would not have been able to pay their bills after a $400 emergency expense. Uh, this situation has only worsened since the pandemic began. Crafting greater equity requires consistent, thoughtful work. As a member of the Board of Appeals, I would try to ensure that our actions are cognizant of this reality. To the extent that the development standards or other requirements of the county uh, zoning ordinance permit the board to exercise discretion in its deliberations, I will endeavor to exercise that discretion with the goal of contributing to racial equity and social justice. Thank you very much, Mr. England. Uh, the last question should be fairly straightforward. Um, I'll start with you, Mr. England. Is there any actual or potential conflict of interest or anything else in your background of which the council should be aware? Not that I can make of, Mr. President. Thank you so much, Mr. Grimes. I have no conflicts of interest and you're already aware, all of you, I believe, with my background as a community advocate and I will point out that none of that, uh, you will not be able to think of any, uh, would conflict with uh, distinguished service on the Board of Appeals. Thank you. Mr. Pinedo. No, I don't have any conflict of interest. I retired from GAO and have the time to serve. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Well, fantastic. Well, all three of you done a very extraordinarily and comprehensive job of responding to the questions because there aren't any additional questions from my colleagues. Uh, as is often the case, we are fortunate in Montgomery County to have such incredibly qualified and respected civic activists and, and leaders, uh, such as the three of yourselves. So this will be a difficult decision for the council, um, but I thank you all very much for your interest and we will be following up soon. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Take care and good afternoon. All right, we now move on to uh, the next item on the agenda, which is moving on to legislative session, day number four, introduction of bills. Uh, the first bill we will be discussing is Bill 322, um, a Legislative Branch Climate Assessments. Uh, the lead sponsors are Councilmember Hucker and myself. I'll defer to Councilmember Hucker to uh, uh, set the stage for this one, and then we'll speak uh, immediately after him. So, Councilmember Hucker. Thank you so much, uh, Council President. First, I have to thank you for co-introducing this with me. It's great to work with you on this. It's going to be a great day for our climate, I predict. Um, and I want to thank the Climate Action Plan Coalition and its members for all their support and partnership. Um, obviously, we have we always have a responsibility to address and understand the impacts and the implications of the policies we put forward um, and to ensure that they're going to have a positive impact on our community. Um, we already assess the equity impact of our bills and budget measures um, to make sure that we are um, taking the right action and using the equity lens that we promised the community following the initiative spearheaded by Council President Novato in 2019. So it obviously makes perfect sense that we should do the same level of assessment for the impact our policies have on the climate and environment. And five years ago, we declared a climate emergency. It's indisputable. We're way behind in meeting the goals that we set at the time where they were very ambitious. We have to take swift and unified action. Um, and so this is a very straightforward bill, just to move us in the right direction by assessing how proposed legislation will impact our climate goals. Um, and it will uh, require the same types of statements to the council from our terrific Office of Legislative Oversight that we get on racial equity issues. So uh, with that, it's, it's straightforward back to you, Mr. Uh, council President, thanks again. 
Thank you, Councilmember Hucker. This council and previous councils have been very focused on climate change, and we recognize that at the local level, we have an extraordinarily important role to play uh, in helping to keep our community safe. And I also want to uplift the terrific work of our Office of Legislative Oversight uh, and the fantastic analysis that they have provided uh, in so many in so many ways. And I think it's working extraordinarily well. Uh, there have been many amendments to bills that have been established thanks to their great work, and I fully expect that to uh, keep moving forward. So I'm honored to be co-leading this with you, Council Member Hucker. Uh, we do have a couple of colleagues that would like to speak. I'll turn now first to Council Member Friedson and then Council Vice President Glass. Council Member Friedson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Member Hucker. Uh, uh, a good day for the climate at the council here indeed. I, I predict as well, just wanted to be added as a co-sponsor to this and just wanted to note, I think uh, this is part of a significant effort this council has uh, really led on to make sure that in our policy making that we are uh, being thoughtful and we're leading with our values, whether it's racial equity and social justice that uh, Council Member Navarro led or the uh, economic impact statement that, that I worked on and uh, with all of you, uh, this is uh, an obvious uh, next opportunity to make sure that we're doing that, not just in part of what we do, but as part of everything that we do. So. Just wanted to thank you uh, for your leadership on that and uh, would like to be listed as a co-sponsor. Thank you. Thank you. Council Vice President Glass, followed by Council Member Katz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Council Member Hucker, for introducing this. I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor because we, we need to be aware of how our decisions here at the Council impact the climate. Uh, you know, similar to this, uh, I led an effort at the Transportation Planning Board to have all future infrastructure projects there be subject to a similar analysis so that all decisions that were made there, uh, we would have our eyes wide open. And so I uh, think that is a good policy to have here too, and look forward to uh, having OLO add this to their already incredible work that they do for us. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Navarro had her hand raised. I apologize to trying to juggle back and forth. So Councilmember Navarro, you're next. Thank you, Mr. President. I also would like to be added as a co-sponsor, and I really appreciate uh, the Council's efforts to put in structural tools that would help track the work and also be able to uh, see how are we making decisions, uh, how are we progressing in, in some of these goals. I am a huge believer of, of structural tools, and I think this one is absolutely critical. Thank you, Councilmember. Hucker and um, look forward to the bill. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Katz, followed by Councilmember Rice. Thank you, Mr. President. I too would like to be added as a co sponsor. And my colleagues have already so clearly stated what the reasons that we all should be doing this. So thank you very much. Please add me. Thank you. And Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Please add me as a co sponsor. Thank you. All right, uh, Councilmember Juwando. Let's make it a nine for nine. I'd like to be added as co-sponsor as well. Thank you for the sponsors. And I, I'm glad about the excitement about this to interplay with the racial equity and social justice bill, because there's a lot of overlapping issues. Uh, and in the budget, we're gonna have to talk about OLO's work uh, workload, make sure they can do this as well, but excited about it. Thank you, Councilmember Hucker and Council President Alvaro. Thanks, thank you, colleagues. Uh, this is a party. <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, Council Member Rice. Yep. Oh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to highlight one of the things that wasn't said, but was kind of uh, alluded to, um, was that uh, our current work with racial equity and social justice really should tie in well with this because climate change disproportionately affects those who yeah. suffer from socioeconomic inequalities as well as the majority of people of color. And so from that standpoint, It'll be very interesting to see how this analysis cuts across both lenses, uh, because from a racial equity and social justice piece that we were already evaluating all of our legislation on, this will have another layer of that uh, to it. So I think that it's great from that perspective. It really goes hand in hand with what Councilmember Navarro led us with before. And so from that perspective, I'd just like to be added as a co-sponsor and full support. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Rice, and I apologize. I skipped you there. <laughs> so. Uh, that is unanimous among colleagues, so thank you all. That bill is now officially introduced. There will be a public hearing 
scheduled on uh, March 1st uh, uh, at 1.30 p.m. Um, item 10 was postponed, um, and so that takes us to uh, uh, bills, uh, call for bills for final reading. Uh, so we will now uh, discuss Bill 4421, uh, the Montgomery County Green Bank Funding Fuel Energy Tax Revenue. Uh, our Government Operations and Fed Committee recommends enactment with amendments. So I will now turn to our committee chairs uh, to give an overview of the deliberation and discussion in committee. Mr. President, I, th I think there's a mistake in the agenda. It was uh, GO and, and T and E. Oh, I so, apologize. Geo I'll and be, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll be, uh, uh, I think starting and Councilmember Nevada will uh, correct all my mistakes. Um, so I want to thank the, uh, uh, certainly the Chamber of Commerce, AOBA, and, the, and as well as the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and the Sierra Club and National Housing Trust and the Climate Action Plan Coalition um, for all their help on this bill. Um, we have a really broad array of groups behind this initiative, uh, uh, which is why the Washington Post um, called it uh, the initiative, they said, has managed to skirt the tensions that have dogged, dogged other climate initiatives in the county of 1 million. Um, thanks so much to uh, Councilmember Friedson for being co-lead on this and all his uh, thoughts and insights. I think we started talking about this like three years ago um, and all of my colleagues uh, for supporting it. Um, I think this bill is win, win, win. It's the biggest investment in climate that we've made, but it will also create hundreds of jobs for workers in our local economy at a time when we really need it. And once it's in effect, it'll save millions of dollars in energy bills for both our residential and our commercial tenants and our residential and commercial building owners, which is good for everybody, every element of our economy. Um, and the focus uh, on equity in the Green Bank's white paper, which was strengthened by the amendment I'm going to mention in just a minute, will make sure that we're addressing our climate without displacing any low income tenants. Um, as, as you know, it dedicates 10% of our energy tax revenues to the Green Bank. Uh, Mr. Deo's here uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much for your leadership and help on this as well, Tom and, and your team. Um, and it will multiply our climate investments many time, times over because unlike us, uh, the Green Bank can leverage funds in the private and public equity markets to provide much greater access to capital to support clean energy financing in the county. Um, it's a, been a really underutilized but powerful tool in our toolbox. It's been underutilized because it's undercapitalized. So this bill puts our money where our policy commitment is and helps us pivot to be back on track to meet our climate goals. Uh, Mr. President, was reported out six to nothing by the Joint Committee. There were two amendments. Councilmember Friedson moved an amendment to require the bank to use 20% of county funds for projects in equity emphasis areas and 15% of the county funds for reducing the cost of energy projects undertaken by property owners. Um, and Councilmember Reamer moved an amendment to prevent the bank from using county funds for uh, mechanical energy appliances that use fossil fuels. Um, and I think there may be a final language coming on that as well, uh, um, in particular. But both were approved unanimously. The amended bill was approved unanimously. And with that, Mr. President, you have a joint committee recommendation before the full council. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Hucker. Uh, Chair Navarro, did you wanna make any comments? Yes, thank you. Um, well, first, really, really um, kudos to Council Member Hucker and Council Member Fritzen. I think it was very well described how um, difficult sometimes it is to bring together a coalition uh, with different sectors and different interests and rally around a particular proposal, especially um, since I know previous councils, we've had many conversations about the uh, fuel energy tax and what to do with it and yeah. to reduce it or not reduce it. And if you do reduce it, what do you do? And if you keep it, what, you know, and, and I think this is a very, very important um, moment where there is a, hopefully pretty soon, there will be a decision to actually literally uh, you know, identify an important priority for the council and figure out ways to use that money in order to leverage more and more resources. I think it aligns so nicely with what the Biden administration also is doing, and it positions the county to be ready for anything else that will come in this space. This is the space of the present and future. And so to me, I think it made a lot of sense um, I particularly also uh, welcome the fact that OLO in their racial, economic, social justice impact note um, did bring up some uh, issues and some concerns. And we were just talking about how important it is to have structural tools 
that help us move forward with our goals. And so, you know, Council Member Fitzen did make a proposal that I think was very appropriate um, that we uh, have actually utilized that kind of approach in other bills um, that gets us to where we need to go in terms of really truly not just having racial equity and social justice impact statements for the sake of having them, but to actually do something that at least mitigates uh, what might have been identified as a concern. So all along, I think this, again, very, very important um, a bill and uh, a very innovative way to um, to utilize these resources and leverage it and uh, really take advantage of a lot of different check a lot of boxes that I know all of us have been talking about for so long. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, co lead of this bill, Councilmember Friedson, wanted to say a few words as well before we get to discussion packet and some um, amendments. Councilmember yeah. Friedson. Thank you very much, uh, Council President. Thank you uh, to uh, Chair Hucker for, for this effort. Uh, it, it's been a great partnership uh, and uh, it really did start, uh, I think, three years ago. I think you're right, almost exactly uh, three years ago. So uh, to say that this is a long time uh, coming uh, is, is to say the least of it. But uh, I think it's a critical step forward as we look at efforts to tackle climate. We do it in a, a collaborative uh, way and we really show Montgomery County's continued leadership uh, on these issues. The Montgomery County Green Bank is an example uh, led by my predecessor, Roger Berliner. And this is, you know, I think the natural next step. I think uh, Council uh, Member Hucker uh, talked about, you know, high school graduation or uh, some life cycle uh, event that we're, uh, we're, we're taking it into adulthood uh, because these are uh, challenges that are gonna require a major commitment and a major investment. And this is uh, one step towards uh, that effort. Uh, the uh, amendments that we discussed in committee, I think are really important as uh, Council Member Navarro uh, just noted, they appropriately uh, connect the uh, racial equity and social justice issues with climate justice issues. As uh, Council Member Rice uh, mentioned earlier, these are not separate uh, issues. These are very related. Uh, issues and uh, you know I think we tried to do what we could to thread the needle uh, there and making that appropriate connection. So uh, looking forward to uh, the discussion today. There's a few uh, clarifying uh, opportunities uh, with amendments, but uh, this is a critical uh, piece of legislation, something that is going to help us really uh, make a dramatic dent uh, in the crisis that we face and uh, really appreciate everybody's efforts and work up to this point to get us to where we are. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jenner, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know there's a, a packet here, a, a last minute comment made by the county attorney and the county executive's office and uh, some amendments, including one uh, that I'm proposing as well, a modest one. Uh, if, if Mr. Drummer, you could walk us through that packet uh, and those amendments. Uh, and I know Councilmember Reamer wanted to speak to his amendments specifically, but if you can provide the context, that would be great. Uh Sure. Good afternoon. There are two amendments in the packet. One is from council member Reamer and they start on page 63 circle 63 of the packet. Uh, get to it, uh, which would phase in as you heard. Before there was an amendment in committee to prohibit the green bank from using the county funds. From funding new mechanical energy equipment that uses fossil fuels or the equipment that upgrades the efficiency of existing mechanical energy equipment that uses fossil fuels. Uh, the amendment that council member Reamer. Uh, asked for would. Um, Delay that prohibition for one year till July 1 of 2023. Uh, just for your information, this bill would take effect on July 1 of 2022 because that's the beginning of the next fiscal year. The council's already set the budget and uh, allocated the energy tax for this year. Um, and so it would delay that prohibition for one year and add a report which is in an uncodified section because it's a one-time report requiring the director of the department of environmental protection to submit a report to the council and the executive 
on or before May 1st of 2023, estimating the cost of convert converting fossil fuel mechanical equipment to electric power. That's the electrification uh, study, and that would give the council the opportunity to see whether the one year delay in phase in was enough. That's the first amendment. I don't know if you want to allow Councilmember Rima to describe it or his reasons for that. Yes, please. So I go into uh, the second one. Councilmember Rima. All right, thank you. Oh, you beat me to the punch there, uh, Mr. Drummer. Um, first of all, I want to say great bill. I uh, really appreciate the sponsors bringing this forward. And, um, you know, it, it's going to make a lot of funding available. And, you know, we're going to, of course, the county executive and the council is going to, we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the budget trade off. I mean, this will devote a share of resources that we're using for other purposes and we're devoting it here. Um, so, we're going to, we're going to handle the uh, implications, um, but this is worth doing. You know, this, what you can do as the sponsors have noted is once you provide this legislatively, it can be bonded and uh, then you can create even more uh, resources for the program. So um, excited about that. The issue we worked on at the committee was just ensuring that the funds were not provided for equipment that was going to lock in several decades of new fossil fuel burning. Um, you know, we wanted this to have our public dollars devoted to projects that are going to be powered uh, potentially with all clean energy or at least from the grid and then powered uh, by the clean energy in the grid, which hopefully will be working towards 100% um, clean. So there, there was some concern, there is concern that you know, a lot of projects are replacing old fossil fuel burning equipment with brand new, more much more efficient fossil fuel equipment, but it's still, you know, fossil fuel equipment. So um, the amendment that we worked on with the Chesapeake Climate Action Network and the Sierra Club and other community advocates will, um, can, you know, just basically establish that the county's funding won't be used for that purpose. Um, we initially had it taken effect as the bill took effect, but in consultation with the Green Bank, and I really appreciate Mr. Dio's great work and everyone involved at the Green Bank, um, you know, we concluded that there was going to need to be a little time to ramp up and, you know, basically get to that point. So the bill would be effective, uh, oh, this provision would be effective, uh, as Bob said, uh, July 1st, 2023. Um, and then we would have a report issued previous to that that we'll talk about the costs of, um, of, you know, phasing out that kind of equipment. So as we proceed, we'll have more information available uh, to better understand that those trade-offs. But um, so that is the, uh, so again, this just gives an extra year to phase in and as the reporting requirement, that is the amendment that as Bob said, it's on, uh, it's on your PDF page 70 in the packet. Um, and so, um, and I, you know, we've consulted with uh, various stakeholders on this, so I believe it is a consensus item. So I would like to move that amendment, please. Or is it the combined Second. amendment? Yeah, thank you. It was moved by Councilmember Reamer, seconded by Councilmember Glass. Is there any discussion? No discussion. So all those in favor of Councilmember Reamer's amendment, please raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. Uh, Mr. Drummer, if you could give an overview of uh, the other amendment, that would be great. Sure. The, the other amendment in the packet uh, would require, uh, and this would be in the codified section, because it'd be there already is required an annual report uh, from the Green Bank. This would put a deadline, uh, say an annual report by December 31st on the activities and finance of the Green Bank. And the addition would be the report must include details about the use and fund balance of county funds. This would give the council the opportunity to see each year if in fact 10% uh, of the energy tax is the appropriate amount for that year. 
um, you would have an idea of how they're using the funds, what they have left, and where they go forward. Because as it's pointed out in the packet, although the bill requires the allocation of 10% each year of the energy tax, uh, the council retains the authority in the budget to modify that each year. So you could increase it or lower it um, each year. Um, so that's what this report would help you do. And the December 31st would, would give the executive time as he's formulating the budget to, to take this into consideration, this report, when he puts out his uh, recommended budget in March. Thank you for that overview, Mr. Drummer. I'm, I'm moving this particular amendment forward. It's fairly straightforward. I did discuss it with the lead sponsors of the bill who didn't have any issues with it. And I did also speak to uh, Mr. Deo in his office and he is here present. And I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Deo, for your tremendous leadership and that of your team. We are here because we have faith in what you all have been able to accomplish since the Green Bank was initiated. And uh, I, I think it just speaks volume to your leadership and, and that of your team. So uh, it's a modest amendment uh, that I'd like to, to move now. And so I just need a second. Second. Uh, seconded by council member Hucker. Uh, any discussion? Uh, hearing none, all those in favor of this amendment, please raise your hands. And that carries unanimously as well. So, uh, Mr. Drummer, were there, was there anything else that we needed to discuss with regards to this bill? Do you want me to talk about the county attorney's opinion uh, that's in the addendum, or have you heard enough of that? I think we've heard enough. Uh, we did, yeah. I'll just note, uh, receive a last minute uh, a concern, uh, and I do mean last minute, um, but I do want to thank you, Mr. Drummer, for uh, addressing that expeditiously. Uh, which I know, based on conversations with colleagues, we greatly appreciated uh, and we feel uh, is uh, not a concern. So uh, with that, um, thank you all. This is going to be a roll call vote. So uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Mr. Friedson. Yes. Mr. Friedson votes yes. Mr. Jawando. Yes. Mr. Jawando votes yes. Mr. Reamer. Yes. Mr. Reamer votes yes. Ms. Navarro? Yes. Ms. Navarro votes yes. Mr. Rice? Yes. Mr. Rice votes yes. Mr. Katz? Yes. Mr. Katz votes yes. Mr. Hucker? Yes. Mr. Hucker votes yes. Mr. Glass? Hit the wrong button. Yes. Mr. Glass votes yes. Mr. Albernoz? Yes. Mr. Albernoz votes yes. Right, let the record show that that passed unanimously. And I think council member Hucker wanted to say one, one final word on this. Final word, Th thanks everybody. And thanks Mr. Drummer for, yes, you're, you're very good, confidential and other opinion. But um, uh, I just want to remind everybody tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, you're all invited. We're being joined by Senator Chris Van Hollen who's been a nationally recognized leader for a decade at setting up green banks and, uh, and others who will be uh, with us to celebrate. So anybody who can get up early and join us, we'd love to see you. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Councilmember Hucker. Well, colleagues, uh, that does it for today's general business. We got a lot of ground covered there as usual. Thank you all so much. And with that, we are adjourned. Commute. Summary.